One more thing about industrialization I did not put anything up here for. Countries that industrialize could build the mass armies and the weapons for war. In 1800, anybody could, well, not anybody, but you could build a navy if you just have wood. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they kind of ought to make a boat and things, but yeah. A certain boat. 1914, you need to be highly industrialized and have to be incredibly wealthy. And only a few countries can do it. It would totally change the power dynamic. And now you have all these people in Europe and the United States with access to more wealth, more power than ever before. Yes. You have to be able to create like steel. Yeah. Giant chips. And, <laughs> and very complex engines. And you need fuel. So that leads us to, if we have more and more, that leads us to number two. But who's getting it? In a lot of places, there are still monarchies who think it's 1650. They're still operating pre-industrial revolution. And yet now they have all this weapons and all this stuff. And many of them are still autocrats or nearly autocrats, which mean total control. And so here is a classic picture of a birthday party. That's Queen Victoria. And this is her family. Not all the kids, but all of them who are members of various royal houses all across Europe. Monarchs are going to be interbred, interbred, what a way to say, intermarried, and they're all cousins or nephews or nieces. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I remember Adrian talked about this year, like a running joke that uh, Russia, Britain, and Germany all fought because they wanted Germans to do <laughs> That's right, yeah, that pretty. They're all jealous of her. They all didn't want her love it. See, who's that? Queen Victoria's niece, Queen Victoria's nephew? Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany. Oh, that's Queen Victoria's niece, who married her cousin, Tsar Nicholas II of Russia. That's a, a creepy, you could assume be King George V. You see it? Yeah. Almost identical. <laughs> We're not going to go Bulgaria, but <laughs> the point is they're all interrelated. That's actually Queen Victoria, somebody who died in Edward. Oh. And the thing about monarchies, whoever your monarch is, why does somebody become king? Because they're related. Birth. Luck or unluck of birth. Somebody is, they're born into it. And if they're born into it, you're stuck with what you get. Sure, you might get a very effective monarch. You might get only a, only a bad despot, but not horrific. You might get an incompetent, an insecure fool, a blustering fool who uh, is jealous of his aunt's navy and wants to prove that he's strong and makes enemies of everybody across the world. <laughs> Because he wants to prove how tough he is. Let's get to Kaiser Wilhelm, or Kaiser Bill, as he'd soon be known as in the United States and Britain, the second. And he became emperor very young, and he had a horrific childhood. You can see it, the cause of it, right in that picture. You can see it? Well, that's a very long. He has a withered left arm. When he was born, he was a breech birth. And to get him out, they had to turn him. And that's a really dangerous thing, especially pre antibiotics. Normally, now they do a C section. They had that then, but. And in the process, they wrenched his shoulder back and horribly dislocated it and never grew back. And so he had this awful withered arm. His whole life he would overcompensate for that. And if he's going to be a, the king of all the Germans, descendants of the great Prussian warriors, he's going to have to be a warrior. And the stories about the torture they would put him through, we'd say abuse, to get him to ride a horse with one arm when he's three years old without a saddle, it's unbelievable. That's what he had to do. What he went through in his whole life, he's going to try to compensate for not having 
for having this withered arm, for not having two arms. No one's going to laugh at him. You can't laugh at it, the Kaiser with a withered left arm is he, if he has the strongest arm in the world and yeah. is willing to use it. And so, once he became emperor at a young age, he was always trying to prove he was tough and being insecure and paranoid and convince people who are laughing at him, and yet he's the emperor with almost complete power, especially in times of war, it's a pretty dangerous recipe. I mean, let me give you an example how insecure he was. So, and I, I mean, there's a sympathy for him in a way, but then it's hard to have sympathy after what's gonna happen. I know it's, it's one of those complex things, but he built his right arm up to be incredibly powerful. He would take a double-edged ax and for hours split wood to build that up. One arm, to have a servant put the, for hours. I mean, just incredibly powerful right arm. And so, when he would shake hands with people, bow and shake their hands, he would grab their hands, and he would squeeze so hard that he would bring them to their knees. They'd cry out in agony. And he'd just hold it. He would have conversations, casual conversations, while people were on the ground, writhing in pain. That's not normal. So he had issues. And think about it. He's insecure, wanting to prove himself in a brand new empire, but also wants to prove himself. And Franz Joseph, don't worry about Karl, but Franz Joseph of Austria, another one. He had been emperor of Austria. Kaiser means, anybody know what Kaiser means? Well, but Caesar. Caesar. Tsar means Caesar for emperor. Even though Caesar wasn't an emperor, he was an emperor. Uh, yeah. That's why they call him. And Franz Joseph of Austria, there he is. He had been on the crown, he had been on the throne since 1848. So in 1914, he's still there. And he is trying everything he can to hold this monarchy together when he has all these different groups within the Austrian Empire, and I'll show you them in a second, that want to break away from their own countries. And so here you have someone thinking, I can still hold this empire like it's 1700 in a modern world. And then the Russians have their own emperor, the autocrat. In fact, the most autocratic emperor in all the world, Tsar Nicholas II, Tsar Caesar. He too became emperor at a young age. He didn't want to be emperor. He was inadequate for the job. He was couldn't make a decision. Not very bright. Didn't really didn't want to do this at all. But that's who they got. And he's the emperor. He too was paranoid. And he's the emperor who's going to look very weak after losing the Russian Japanese War. Almost that um, revolution that spread the country in 1905. He's going to make concessions. They thought made him weak, even though they were fake. And the other thing was, you can see in this picture. For a long time, he didn't get an heir. And in Russia, it has to be male. After Catherine the Great, they said, no, wait, you know, his son, her son, very jealous of his mom, made sure that's going to be a man. And then, the she was called and then when they finally get out of the sun, that's the well, Queen Victoria was a carrier of the hemophilia gene. All related to Queen, you know, Queen Victoria. And here's the thing, as a hemophiliac, adolescence. So think about it. Emperor that already kind of is weak and in a place where he gets his power supposedly from God. He's like a god on earth. He can't have a son, and then when he does have a son, they can't let people know. That just the smallest bruise can kill him. And by the way, that's the thing about hemophilia. It's the bruises. Because they just keep bleeding, internal bleeding, they swell up and cut. They pinch off blood vessels. I guess the pain is unimaginable. Yeah. One of the first people to die of hemophilia actually was in a car crash. And you're only going to like about four miles an hour. Well, not the first person. Well, hemophilia is. I mean, well, hemophilia, but the thing was, and what's we'll bad here is Rasputin, who was this monk from the central Siberian plains, 
And he was able to come into St. Petersburg and somehow he brought comfort to Alessis and during the trust of the royal family. But the problem was, all of a sudden you have this man around. Nobody understood why he was there because they didn't know about the hemophilia. Had to keep that secret. And yet, when he would go out in St. Petersburg, he drank more than any human ever drank and caroused and just seemed like an immoral, unethical influence on the crowd. And it made the whole system seem even weaker. And yet, Russia's industrializing and they're about ready to fight the biggest war that had ever happened up to that time. And so, you have all these old monarchs. I know, a very brief explanation. Don't let me forget, maybe I'll tell you how Rasputin died. Yes. Some of you might know, but it's a good story. Yes. And one more thing. Nicholas, Tsar Nicholas and King George V, their first cousins. That's creepy, isn't it? <laughs> That's like, wow. Slightly different eyes, but other than that, <laughs> Three, imperialism. We already know what imperialism is, improper profit. The United States is going through this imperialistic craze. Much of the world had been conquered by empires. And think about it now. We have the competition for empires. Now you have empires coming into contact. And once you have empires coming into contact, there's going to be wars. And everybody needs a large army to protect their empire. And there's going to be a lot of jealousy. My empire is not as big as your empire, sort of thing. I mean, look at Africa. By 1914, all of Africa except for Ethiopia and Liberia had been taken by European powers. Ethiopia beat back the Italians of the dollars. But uh, blue, France. Uh, Congo didn't go there. That's, that's a little bit wrong. But Congo, light green is Germany, red. Britain, dark green Portugal. By that time, the Congo had gone to Belgium, uh, King Leopold's hand. But all been taken up. But Asia, same thing, Pacific Islands. All this competition for empire. And that almost led to many wars in the 40 years before. Right here, Bashuda, Egypt, or I'm sorry, Britain and France almost went to full scale war in the 1890s. So this competition for empire. It's going to breed wars, but that's not the only place. Look at the European map. Look at Central Europe. There's no Poland. Poland was part of Russia, Britain, and Austria. All these countries here in the Balkans, they were carved out of another empire called the Ottoman Empire, the precursor to Turkey. Same with, yeah, and I'll show you a map in a second how many countries are going to come out of here. You have competition for empire here. Russia and Austria are both intriguing for this area, for control or even conquest. Russia's wanted Constantinople, today it's called Istanbul, forever. And so, these empires, and that leads us to the next thing, nationalism. Nationalism. Now, nationalism, we talk about nationalism as intense love, and patriotism towards your country. I think I put that up here. Yeah, a devotion to your state. And why are you devoted to your state? Your country. Why? Because of what? Yeah, because it's my state. I love my country because it's my country. Therefore, I love my country because it's my country. Therefore, I love my country. <laughs> it's a circle. With patriotism, you love your country for what it stands for, the values. Nationalism is intense love for your country, purely for your country. And leaders like this, because it justifies what they do. Don't question me, I'm doing it for the state. This is a development out of many ways of the French Revolution and the Industrial Revolution, as modern states began to develop. But what about here? Or for that matter, Africa or Asia, all these, col these countries that are colonized. It also is going to mean. You want political independence for your own ethnic group or nationality or race. Independence outside of control. All these different colors here are different ethnic groups in Europe. 
and there's slight differences between the Belarusians or white Russians and Russians, or all these different groups, Hungarians, the purple are Germans. Yeah. Like all the different countries that Germany was before it became. Well, I'll show you a map in Austria is even more. Yeah. And all these places want, but no group at least would be more volatile than the majority population here. Slavs. And Slavic nationalism is going to grow up with Slavic nationalism again. But Slavic nationalism. The Slavic people, then, it's more of a cultural and language issue. There is one Slavic state, Russians. Russians, Belarusians are Slavs. Belarusians, white Russians. There's hardly any difference today. There was a slight cultural and language difference 500 years ago, even though there's a separate Belarus now. Once you get that national identity, it's hard to go away. But Poles are Slavs. Croats, Slovenians, uh, Slovakians, Bosnians, Serbs, Montenegrins, they're all Slavs. And most of them do not have a state. And this would develop the idea of Slavic independence or Slav pan Slavism. I don't know why I put Slavic national Ethics, but a one big Slavic state. And no place was at a great, no empire was at a greater threat than Austria. All these different colors on this map are the largest ethnic groups within the old Austrian Empire. And that's not all of them. For example, it doesn't have the huge Jewish pop population that spread throughout much of the empire. Red are Germans, they're not Slavs. Blue, Czechs, Bohemians, not Slavs. Hungarians, not Slavs. Everybody else, Slavs. So in Austria, except for the German population, Jews, a few other, but all the different colors. And so these people want independent states outside of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Austria-Hungary. Yeah, the, the emperor of Austria was the king of Hungary. That's a weird kind of combination they did in 1867. They just said they were. And Austria was losing control of their, po their population. A shaky multinational empire because the number one ethnic group were Germans. Austrians are Germans. Number two, Hungarians. The majority of everybody else wants their own country. And in 1908, Austria even annexed all this land. They took even more. Remember the boom bus cycle? And we have, you know, starts going into, you know, prices start dropping over production. What does everybody do? <laughs> what did they do first? Prices are dropping. There's overproduction. What did they? Do? What did they do first? They produce more. Think they can work their way out of it? Empires do the same thing. When they start going into decline, what do they do? Yeah. Try to get more to think they can hold on to more. Okay, we got problems. Let's expand to get rid of the problems. Just people don't think. It's easy to think when you're distant from it, but when you're in it, then it becomes. If I just do one more thing, so if I have a problem with these people spreading the revolution here, I'll just take them. And the country that represented the biggest threat to Austria was Serbia. Serbia wanted to create a greater Serbia of all the Slavic peoples. They wanted to take these areas of Austria that were Serbs and make them part of Serbia. By the way, there would be a greater Serbia after the war. Yugoslavia, a Slavic state. Now, Slovaks, I'm sorry, Slovenians, Croatians, Bosnians are ethnically different than Serbs, but they are Slavs. And so you can imagine, if they're trying to breed revolution here, Austria hates them. And so by 1908, you're going to have a real rivalry between this becoming decrepit empire and a really nasty, brutal kingdom of Serbia. And Russia, remember I told you they are intriguing with Austria? They almost went to war with Austria over this in 1908. When Austria annexed this, 
but Russia just lost the Russia Japanese war. But they're like, never again. And so Russia, who are they going to throw their support behind? The Slavic Serbs or the German Austrians? Russia and Serbia. That connection will be the impetus of war. Not planned. And then, I know the buzz bar right around, but let me get to one more thing. So look at this. Here's 1914. Look at 23. How much different Central Europe is going to look. And then it's going to be even dip, more different in 1945 after World War II. And in the 1990s, it's going to erupt again. And I don't know what's going to happen. Fascism is on the rise in Hungary and Poland. Things are, and then we, and if you know anything about Russia, and Belarus, Belarus has an authoritarian king, kingdom too. But let me get one more thing. Oh, there's the Ottomans. Same thing with the Ottomans. All they are in dark orange, or what the Ottoman Empire was when the war began, light orange is what they used to be. All that area used to be part of the Ottoman Turkish Empire. That's why there's a large Muslim population. Okay, we have a little left to finish tomorrow. Make sure you have your grades in the field. Are there any questions about the registration? The test, those of you who missed it, we just got to get the short IDs. I'm an employee. If you have any trouble, just call Same thing, if you have any trouble, let me know. And then you got to take it, the short IDs. Yeah, we did the short ideas. We hear about the top of it. What? And then this, um, sticky music and top three times. Sure. Did you miss that? Why is it missing? I don't think I did because I don't remember. All right, I'll give you a few more days, but you might have missed it. I thought I said it, but maybe I didn't. I mean, like, did you say it?